Okay, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Gemma. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Akiko Kondo uh, from Hyogo University of Teacher Education uh, in Japan. Uh, first, I'd like to show my great appreciation for giving me such a wonderful opportunity. I'm so honored. Uh, I have been teaching English as a foreign language and I do such an SLA, SLA in Japan for about 20 years. Uh, today, based on my research and uh, teaching practice, I like to share my ideas about teaching and learning ELT pronunciation. Uh, in this talk, I primarily uh, discuss Japanese EFL learners because I have been teaching them for a long time. So it means that the uh, ideas and information I'm going to share in this talk may not be completely applicable to your uh, situa situation, but I hope that my ideas will be of some help to you. Okay, uh, this is the outline of my talk. First, I'd like to talk about individual differences in the acquisition of LT pronunciation. Although there are several factors that influence the mastery of LT pronunciation, my focus is on aptitude or cognitive factors. Uh, of the aptitude factors, I'm especially interested in the role of memory for which I have conducted studies for years. So therefore, in this talk, I would like to share my research on the role of memory in the learning of L2 pronunciation. Then finally, uh, based on my teaching and research experience, I'd like to share some pedagogical uh, suggestions. Okay, individual differences. Probably as you have noticed in your teaching, different learners show different levels of mastery of the target language. Uh, of the language skills, I think pronunciation is the one skill that highlights individual attainment differences. Personally, uh, pronunciation skills do not seem to be always correlated with other language skills, such as uh, vocabulary, grammar, reading, and writing. I, I think uh, so those skills are kind of related, strongly related with uh, IQ. However, in my experience, the, the acquisition of pronunciation is somewhat different as it involves motor skills, like a moving uh, tongue or uh, lips or, or something. And um, uh, I have encountered several students whose written English test scores and their pronunciation skills are not kind of inconsistent. Let me talk about one uh, case, uh, one of my students, uh, his name is Yuji. Uh, his TOEIC score was 200 something out of 990, so which indicates that uh, uh, his English listening and reading uh, proficiency were very low. However, when I heard him repeating English words and sentences, his pronunciation was really good. And, uh, I, and uh, it was much better than one of the students who had the highest TOEIC score than him. And uh, one day I asked him, did you get uh, some special treatment uh, instruction to improve your pronunciation? And he said, no, but he told me that uh, uh, he, yeah, he's in, very interested in, in English songs. And uh, since he was very young, he used to English songs and because his parents uh, really liked the Beatles and uh, those uh, British, British movies, I'm uh, sorry, songs. And so intuitively, I kind of sensed that uh, there is some link between, link between music and pronunciation. But for this topic, I will talk about it later. So anyway, this observation made me very interested in individual differences in LT pronunciation. And also I got interested in what factor could explain these differences. And as you know, there are many factors, uh, significant predictors for the acquisition of L2 pronunciation, such as age of onset, the linguistic differences between L1, L1 and the target language, personality, gender, motivation, and aptitude. Especially, I'm very interested in uh, aptitude factors because like um, um, the, uh, based on my teaching experience, I found that the, uh, the amount of effort and the achievement are not correlated, it's correlated. So that's why I got inter interested in aptitude. Uh, let me talk about language aptitude, aptitude first. As you know, Carol uh, proposed four language aptitude constituents. 
phonetic coding ability, uh, I will call PCA, uh, grammatical sensitivity, both uh, rote learning ability and inductive language learning ability. So PCA, I think is the most closely related to pronunciation. And uh, this refers to the capacity to code um, familiar sounds so that they can be retained for more than a few seconds and subsequently retrieved or recognized. In other words, the ability to reprodu reproduce an unfamiliar language as it has been heard. So for this, uh, uh, the role of PCA, in fact, who et al. 2013 revealed that PCA accounted for the significant variance in German L2 pronunciation skills. And for the fact that you explain PCA, speech perception and uh, speech motor control were report reported to play important roles in PCA. In fact, an fMRI study, uh, that's a brain study, revealed that an aptitude for L2 pronunciation relies heavily on speech perception and speech motor control abilities. So let me talk about the, let me start with the perception ability. Uh, perception skills has been considered to be a uh, um, prerequisite or basic, basic for the production of target language sounds. So an SLA study by during et al. 1997 found that the L2 sound production issues could be attributed to perception. And uh, as one of the key factors influences uh, influencing the speech perception, I'd like to discuss the influence of age factors first. As you know, sound perception ability decline with age, and this type of hearing loss begins earlier than people might think. And then um, uh, a clinical study reported that the hearing loss started during adolescence, which may uh, partly support the clinical um, sorry, critical period hypothesis. Uh, this hypothesis proposes that uh, it's best to master a language, a new language in a certain time window, uh, in general, early teenage. So this hypothesis has been strongly debated and uh, there's a pros and cons. However, um, the uh, research uh, debates about the best time in life to acquire pronunciation skills has been less controversial uh, compared to other language skills. So I think uh, it's plausible that the age of onset to learn a target language, so language sound could explain the perception of the ability for L2 pronunciation. And then uh, even in people of the same age, distinct sound recognition ability differences has been observed. For another factor, the kinds of sounds people are constantly exposed to may influence their hearing perception ability. For this, I'd like to talk about the passband. I'm not sure if you are familiar with this concept. Uh, passband refers to the range of frequencies that uh, are predominant in the language. Mirasa in 1998 found that the different languages had a different unique passband. So for example, English passband ranges from 2000 Hertz to 12,000 Hertz. On the other hand, uh, my native language Japanese passband ranges from 125 Hertz to 1500 Hertz. Of course, uh, there's a, a, a speech variable, a speaker's variables, like male, female, but uh, this is average. So when the passband of the learner's native language is similar to that of the target language, I think it's easier for the learner to recognize the target language sounds. So therefore, it is natural that the learner expect yeah, I'm sorry, the learners exposed to target language sounds range, uh, ranges of frequency tend to be a good language learner. And another linguistic differences factor uh, to explain speech perception ability is related to the number of kinds of phonemes. Theoretically, when learners can transfer their L1 knowledge to, uh, to learning on L2, the difficulty level is higher than when they can. So uh, for learners who speak a native language that has a smaller phonological system, it is more difficult to learn the target language sound, a uh, target language that has a larger phonological system because there are fewer sound features they can transfer from the L1. So let me talk about one example. 
example, uh, the case of Japanese EFL learners. Uh, Japanese has uh, five vowels and 50 consonants, whereas English has uh, 14 vowels and 25 consonants. I think the number might be different depending on the linguist, but uh, it's clear that the English has more phonemes than Japanese. So this is one reason why that uh, for Japanese uh, learners, it's difficult to produce uh, learn uh, English sounds. Okay, as well as perception ability, uh, let me talk about speech motor control ability. Uh, this uh, is another factor influence L2 uh, production skills. People who have good motor skills can, can generally move their articulatory muscles as intended. Uh, however, people with weaker motor skills can move there appropriately, even if they can perceive the sound. Uh, some people are able to produce this, the target sound just by listening once, whereas others need a lot of practice and instruction. And even the worst case, they are unable to do it, it even after significant practice and instruction. And then some people even have difficulty in producing some specific L1 phonemes. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Uh, uh, former Prime Minister Abe, I think he had a problem with a uh, Japanese R sound, Rarirudero. He produced like a Dadirudero instead of Rarirudero. And uh, speaking of me, I kind of difficulty in producing this S sound, Japanese S sound. Anyway, so, so this is related to a motor. Uh, this kind of physical ability could be a factor that cause individual differences in L2 pronunciation skills. Okay, now uh, uh, next as a final aptitude factor, I'd like to discuss the influence of musical ability. As I mentioned earlier, as the case of Yuji indicates, I kind of intuitively sensed that there are possibly some links between pronunciation and music. And actually, some of the colleagues told me uh, that uh, uh, they had observed similar cases. So, uh, so that's why I got interested in this topic. And then I found that the researchers claimed that the structural similarities between language and music, and for, for example, uh, Tanaka and Nakamura claimed that the intonation is similar to the melodic contour of music in that both had a temporal change in fundamental frequency and rhythm structure. And also Mora 2000 also claimed that uh, uh, as music and language stem from the processing of sound, so they share features such as pitch, volume, prominence, stress, tone, rhythm, and pauses. And also several brain studies have also found that the strong link between the cognitive process related to language and music. And also a study in, uh, investigating Finnish uh, EFL learners showed that positive relationship between a musical ability and the L2 pronunciation. Okay, now I'd like to talk about my research. Uh, uh, my topic is a uh, role of memory in L2 pronunciation, uh, which is related to the PCA I discussed earlier. Uh, uh, before learners can produce target language sound, they first need to listen to and memorize the sound, internet, uh, sound information. So, so memory capacity uh, or phonological short-term memory capacity uh, played a very important role. So, uh, phonological short-term memory capacity refers to the ability to retain speech sound information for a short time. So let me share the result of, of my, some of my studies. The so first one, uh, I'd like to share uh, the study uh, which investigated the effects of phonological short-term memory on Japanese EFL learners' English pronunciation skills. Okay, so here's uh, uh, the purpose of the study. I investigate the effects of uh, short-term memory from two different aspects, uh, which are verbal and non-verbal, or I call acoustic aspects of phonolog phonological short-term memory. Okay, and uh, for methods, I asked 156 Japanese EF learners to participate in my study. Uh, they are university students and their English proficiency is overall intermediate. 
And then I measured their verbal phonological short-term memory ability uh, using an um, L1-based disease span test and then pseudo-word repetition test. So then for acoustic phonological short-term memory, I use a tonal memory span test and a rhythm memory span test. And for LT pronunciation, I use an English word and sentence reproduction test uh, in which a uh, student listen to a model English word word and sentence and reproduce it. And then I conducted the regression analysis to answer the research questions and here are the results. As the result shows, uh, I found that both verbal here, verbal and uh, acoustic phonological short-term memory were significant predictors of L2 pronunciation skills. And for verbal one, 25% 25.3% explained variance in L2 pronunciation. And for acoustic one, 21.3% explained variance in L2 pronunciation. And so these numbers kind of higher than expected. And then let me talk about another study, uh, which I published last year. The main topic is aptitude versus motivation. And then uh, uh, this is a, a purpose of the study. I investigated the extent to which two different variables, uh, L2 motivation and working memory capacity, explain the variance in L2 speaking skills by Japanese EFL learners. And then for this study, I asked 111 Japanese EFL learners to participate. And I measured their working, uh, their speaking skills and L2 motivation and working memory capacity. And here are the results. I also conducted a, a regression analysis. And then first, please take a look at the, this figure. Uh, for overall L2 speaking skills, both motivation and working memory capacity had, uh, had significant influence on L2 speaking skills. And comparing the effect size here, uh, the effect size of the two factors, um, uh, motivation has a stronger influence on L2 speaking. I also examined the influence on four speaking subskills like uh, uh, vocabulary in speaking, grammar in speaking, fluency, and pronunciation. And then, uh, so the main topic of this talk is pronunciation. So please uh, look at this uh, figure. Uh, as a result of L overall L2 speaking skills, uh, the uh, L2 motivation had a larger effects than working memory capacity. So here, the, this is effect size. So I think these results are kind of good news for both learners and teachers because uh, motivation can be improved through regular classroom learning. But uh, working memory also can be improved but they need a special treatment uh, to improve their working memory capacity. And I think it's difficult to offer in a regular English classroom. Okay, so now let me move on to the pedagogical suggestions. I talked about, I will, I will talk about uh, focus of instruction and then uh, native, uh, teachers native language and using authentic media and using uh, computer software and uh, teaching framework. Okay, first, focus of instruction. So in many regular English classes, uh, we don't have enough time just to focus on improving their student, students' uh, pronunciation skills because we need to cover other language skills. So teachers need to uh, design curricula that improve intelligibility and comprehensibility while making the best use of the limited class time. And uh, several studies have examined whether teacher focus on uh, should focus on segmentals or super segmentals when giving pro uh, pronunciation instruction. And has, however, as you can see here, that th these are related studies. Uh, the results are uh, kind of inconsistent. Some studies have indicated that the importance of super segmental features in terms of enhancing their intelligibility abilities. So these studies for emphasize on the importance of super segmental features. But on the other hand, so these study, there's a study that emphasize on the importance of segmental features in, 
in terms of intelligibility. And uh, so probably these inconsistent results could be, could be uh, because of the diff uh, methodological issues, uh, differences. But uh, so this inconsistent could be partly attributed to the linguistic differences related to phonetic and phonological distance. And then several studies indicated that, that the source of intelligibility problems was uh, because of a specific L1 and the target combinations. Uh, in the study, the native Polish speakers indicated that the segmental feature production by other European countries uh, significantly contributed to their intelligibility problems. But on the other hand, they uh, Polish native speakers, they tended to focus on super segmental issues such as intonation and word stress when they tried to comprehend uh, Chinese learners of English, uh, sorry, Chinese learners of Polish. So this is because the Chinese learners use super segmental systems that are very different from those of native Polish speakers. So, so when many, so, so the combination L1 and uh, the target language is very important thing uh, researchers and teachers to think about. And moreover, uh, we need to think about the, uh, the, the type of speakers with whom uh, learners communicate. Uh, Jenkins, uh, she's a big name in this field, argued that the segmentals played a more vital role than super segmental features in communication between non-native English speakers. The rationale for this claim was supported by the discovery that speech was processed in different ways by native speakers and non-native speakers. That is, uh, when attempting to comprehend a message, native speakers tend to use more top-down processing that depends on larger speech units, uh, that is super segmentals. On the other hand, native, speaking, native speakers depend on bottom-up processing and depend on smaller units, that is segmentals. Um, I'm not completely sure if it's true or not, but if Jenkins is correct, when prioritizing instruction, teachers should consider the context in which their students are communicating or who the main interlocutors are. Okay. And then also we, have, we should think about the effect, instructional effective, effectiveness when designing instruction. And some instructors have raised doubt about the efficacy of pronunciation instruction because improvement is achieved less easily than for other, for other language skills like uh, grammar and vocabulary. However, um, previous studies have found that the pronunciation instruction significantly, significantly affected the speech production of both features. And then Saito 2012 found that uh, instructional effects were evident in most studies. Uh, he reviewed 15 uh, studies and then, uh, and then uh, he reviewed that the, uh, he found that the, uh, these instructional effects may vary depending on type of speech task. He reviewed that the segmental and super segmental features could be improved through focus on form type of instruction. However, most studies have failed to demonstrate any improvement using form or meaning type of instruction, uh, which may have been because of the amount of, fo of focus required by their cognitive resources, that is a working memory capacity. Uh, so they need to uh, allocate working memory capacity to, to the tasks. Uh, in focus on form type task, learners can easily focus on their speech sounds and because they don't have to construct the message retrieving by retrieving the language information from their long-term memory. But in the focus on meaning type task, learners need to use their working memory capacity to both monitor their speech sound and also construct the message to check whether the message has been correctly conveyed. Okay, and then um, let me talk about briefly about the uh, teacher's native language. Um, uh, maybe most of you uh, know that uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of native speaking teachers and then uh, non-native speaker, non-native speaking teachers. And I'm not 
claiming that the one type of t-shirt is better than the others. But I think making use of both advantages, I, uh, uh, a native and non-native speaking team teaching approach could be both beneficial for students. And um, if I have enough time, maybe I, I might come back to this topic later, but let me move on to the next topic. And then I'd like to suggest that one is of providing not only audio, but also visual information in teaching L2 pronunciation. Um, uh, usually, motive pronunciation is, is, uh, is presented in audio files. However, uh, several studies have suggested that it would be more effective if the model sounds were presented using visual information. A study on Japanese EF learners examined the effects of using audiovisual training to teach pronunciation, found that uh, it was more effective than audio only training. So regarding the link between visual and audio information, uh, have you heard of the Mugger effect? Uh, the the Mugger effect refers to the most sensory illusion that occurs in audiovisual speech. Uh, Mugger and uh, McDonald's recorded the uh, uh, voice articulating a consonant and uh, dubbed it, it with a face articulating another cons consonant. So even though the speech sound was easily recognized alone, after the dubbing with a different uh, visual information, a facial face movement, it was heard as another consonant. So, so this uh, effect indicates that there is a strong link between visual and audio when they process speech sound. And then, as I had discussed, there is a link between visual audio information when people process speech. And let me talk about the, uh, the using the authentic materials to teach pronunciation. Um, and, uh, using using audiovisual materials such as film could be a good assistant in teaching pronunciation. And um, it doesn't have to be film, but the film has some, uh, some advantages. For example, first, it offers a large amount of exposure to the target language without boring. And then also uh, this audio visual type exposure helps learners create cognitive link between the audio and the speaker's mouth movement when making the sounds. And also film offer authentic targeted, targeted language in context. And uh, as to learn uh, super segmental features such as intonation and the stress, uh, context uh, play, play uh, important roles. So with films, students can learn the super segmental features of the target language with near authentic context. Okay, uh, if I have time, I, uh, I would like to show a, a lesson plan using a movie later. And then another authentic material, songs. Earlier, I talked about the relationship between music and pronunciation. So I'd like to share one teaching practice by Takahashi. Uh, they use a nursery rhyme, twinkle, twinkle, little star, to improve Japanese learners' pronunciation. And so, as this nursery rhyme is very popular, uh, most students already know the melody and the Japanese lyric, lyrics. So first, I'd like to show you the, the musical score of this song with the Japanese lyrics. So let me sing a little bit. So, kira kira hikaru. So as you can probably, probably notice, each note has each Japanese motor and they sing like this. So this kind of indicates a Japanese speech pattern. pattern. Uh, in Takahashi's uh, teaching practice, in the first step, uh, they had their students sing this song providing the, uh, this musical score uh, using English lyrics. And then many of their students sang like this. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. So maybe you can notice that, that uh, they added unnecessary vowels in some parts which is a kind of typical feature of Japanese EFL learners. 
And then next step, uh, the student were provided with the English model uh, sound singing. And then and then some learners were able to omit. So with the model, some learners were able to omit the uh, unnecessary vowels to be able to, uh, to be more in line with the model. However, there are still some students who, who still sang who still sang using a Japanese accent, adding uh, unnecessary vowels. And then in the next step, uh, that uh, Takashi provided an edited musical score like this. So this is a musical score. So, so they changed the rhythm pattern like this. Da, 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 da. And then, and then so, um, they provided this musical score, also uh, model singing, and the student who still had a problem improved a lot. So they sing like a twinkle, twinkle, little star. So, uh, so this uh, the reason this change happened uh, was possibly because the time or rhythm span was not long enough for them to produce an extra syllable. So in the edited version, the note here, second and the fourth and sixth notes were really short. So which meant that the student could not help but omitting the syllable. Uh, so this is just one example of using song, but I think uh, there are various pronunciation features you can use songs. Okay. And then using software, uh, I like to discuss the value of using computer software to learn pronunciation. And uh, so I usually use a, a computer program called Ami Voice Call. And uh, I, 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 I use this software for a long time. And this uh, software gives learners a verbal and visual feedback about speech. And uh, here's an example of the speech. I'm sorry, this is a software designed for Japanese EF learners and the feedbacks are written in Japanese, but I will explain in English. And um, um, on the left part, uh, so students read aloud the sentence and record uh, the speech on, on this uh, software. And then after recording uh, uh, here on the left box, the learner were told which segmental aspects were problems. Like here, er sounds like Japanese R. Like, and, then, and also in the right box, uh, they can see the rhythm or frequency pattern of their speech compared with the native speaker model. So while this software particularly designed for Japanese EFL learners, there are several similar uh, computer applications. For example, Elsa Speak, maybe many of you know, know that. Uh, Elsa has similar functions such as giving visual feedback on the learner's speaking performance. Okay, and then let me briefly talk about the advantage of this kind of uh, self-learning, uh, self-learning type of computer software. So with this software, they can practice as much as they can. And also students can practice without feeling pressure from their classmates. But however, uh, self-learning software st uh, strongly depend on the student's autonomy or self-regulation. So, uh, which means that the teachers need to be involved in some way. So they need to motivate their students who are less likely to engage in this type of self-learning. It might be difficult, but as well as instructing the student to take logs of their learning, I think having regular meeting to discuss their progress is, is very important. So to best utilize this type of self-learning application, what I do is to have the student set a specific target for the pronunciation future they want to improve during the semester and they help them achieve those goals. And uh, I think that stimulates their intrinsic motivation. In my teaching experience, when students feel, they are, feel that they are making progress, their motivation increases a lot. Okay. Okay, so lastly, I'd like to talk about teaching framework. Uh, I'd like to, uh, the, 
A pronunciation tasks can sometimes be mechanical and such as listen and repeat type of practice. But the SLA experts argue that pronunciation teacher teaching should be discourse level ultimately. Have you ever observed that uh, even though you're even though the students can able to uh, the target sounds on the intelligible level during a mechanical drill or repetition type practice, but when they engage in free speech or a meaning in focused communication task suddenly they cannot produce them on the intelligible level. The main reason for this is that uh, they have limited working cap memory capacity to pay close attention to their own pronunciation. So in meaning focused communication tasks, especially for beginning level of learners, the majority of their cognitive resource, uh, which is a working memory, is used for construct constructing English expressions by retrieving language information from their long-term memory. And as a result, they have fewer cognitive resources to pay attention to uh, monitor uh, their speech sound. So uh, I'd like to introduce a teaching framework that Sales Malsir suggested. I think many of you here are familiar with this pronunciation teaching framework, but briefly, uh, let me uh, briefly explain each stage. There are five stages. And then in the first stage, description analysis, uh, teachers provide an explanation about the target pronunciation. And after that, in the second uh, stage, they practice listening, the target, uh, listening to the target feature. And then in the third, uh, controlled probe practice. Uh, in this step, they read aloud or listen re repeat the sentence or sentences or passage. And they don't have to uh, construct what they speak. And then, so they, they just uh, pay attention to their, their pronunciation. And then in the next step, step force guided uh, practice. Uh, so in this step, the word and sentence patterns are provided, provided, but the learners need to create what they speak by adding or filling in words or phrases. And the last step, communicative practice. Uh, in this step, only the speaking context is provided and the, the student need to construct whole sentences or message uh, what they are going to say. So this step-by-step -step teaching framework enable learners to practice producing target sound in communicative discourse while adequately allocating their, uh, their working memory. Uh, I have given pronunciation classes following this framework for a long time. And then after every, les every lesson, I asked the student how the lessons were. And then most of my students reported that as they moved through the steps, they had more difficulty in monitoring or paying attention to their pronunciation when engaging in the speaking practice, especially in the last step. So, Pro, to produce, I'm sorry, sorry, to reduce the cognitive burden, one of the solutions could be to recycle the tasks or topics several times. That would reduce the cognitive resources needed to construct what they are going to say. And then as a result, give them more attention to, to their uh, pronunciation. Okay. okay, so do I have time? Okay. So I'd like to share my lesson plan that follow this framework. And then the target feature is uh, sentence prominence. And then I used a uh, Legally Blonde, that's a Hollywood movie. It's kind of um, uh, old movie, but I like this movie. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to show the movie clip I used for this lesson. Can you hear? One of the reasons I wanted to come here tonight was to discuss our future. And I am fully amenable to that discussion. Good. Well, you know how we're going to have all kinds of fun, right? Yeah. Well, Harvard is going to be different. Law school is a completely different place. And I need to be serious. Of course. I mean, my family expects a lot from me. What? I expect a lot from me. Plan a life for office someday. And I fully support that, man. You know that, right? Absolutely. But the thing is, if I'm going to be a senator by the time I'm 30, I need to stop dicking around. Oh, Connor. 
I completely agree. Yeah. <laughs> That's why it's time for us. So, who will? I, think I we do. Should break. Okay. Uh, this is a, a script I provided uh, for students. I'm not sh so I don't. I'm not completely sure that, that this is appropriate um, movie clip for classroom. <laughs> but but anyway, um, okay. Uh, for for the first step, uh, description analysis. I explained the rules and patterns of the target feature sentence prominence, and I have and I gave them a script and they have them uh, mark the sentence prominence on the script. With us, uh, without viewing the movie clip, and the second step, listening discrimination. Student check the places of the sentence prominence by watching the target scene, and the third, in the controlled practice, student engage first student engage in listening and uh, listen and repeat practice with the movie clip, and after that they do role play with the edited movie uh, clip. Uh, in the in this role play, uh, students play Warner's part. I would like to show you the edited movie clip for this activity. So with this movie, edited movie clip, so um, they can play uh, Warner's part. Okay. Right, and then fourth step, uh, in the guided practice, I give this kind of worksheet here. Uh, I guess in, I, they engage in the Q and A activity in pair. One student asks questions, and the other student answer by filling the appropriate word based on the, uh, the, the, the the dialogue of the movie. So in this step, they need to allocate their cognitive resources or working memory, not only in their pronunciation but also finding the word or phrase uh, phrase to fill in the sentence. And the last step. Uh, fifth step, communicative practice. They engage in the situation role play activity. They provided only the situation such as breaking up with, uh, with their boyfriend, which is the topic of this movie scene. And then they do the role play with their partner for the provided uh, this situation. Okay, so uh, uh, in, uh, in this talk, I discussed the individual aptitude differences associated with uh, learning pronunciation. Uh, individual differences in this area affect the way learners uh, master LT pronunciation skills and the amount of effort does not necessarily and does not always explain or predict the level of, of skill which learners attain. So uh, I think uh, it is hoped that the teachers understand those individual factors affecting their student speech, knowing that uh, it is not always because of lack of effort by a student. And it's important to design the instruction method accordingly rather than teaching as they, uh, as they learned or were taught. Okay. Okay, so here are the references. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, kind of Ori, <laughs> Gemma. Thank you so um, much. <laughs> anyway, okay, so thank you, thank you so much for your kind attention and patience. Okay, so maybe Great. I will get many comments and questions later. Okay. Thank you, Akiko. That was super. And yeah, lots of interesting chat going on, um, particularly during, during your, your film clip as well. So we'll get on to the Q&A because I think uh, there will be a few questions for you. So if you've got okay. a question for Akiko, you can either write it in the chat box or put your hand up and we'll come to you. I think um, Pav had some good questions. Uh, first of all, oh, we'll go to um, Flor de Maria. Apologies, everyone, in advance for any mispronunciations. So um, they have asked, do your students practice listening discriminations between the Japanese language sounds and the English language sounds? Or do they practice English, la English language discrimination? 
I'll start again. Or do they practice English language listening discrimination sounds only? Uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the lesson, during the lesson I shared. I presume so, yes. Uh, uh, okay. So uh, on, I, I have them practice uh, repeating uh, the only in English. No, I didn't provide a Japanese version because uh, the class I used this uh, I used this lesson. Their uh, uh, English level is is relatively good, so I didn't provide a Japanese word, a Japanese information. Did I, did I answer the question? Hopefully, Flora will get back to us, but I think so. Yes, she said they did. They did. Um, we've had a couple of questions about the software program. Was it Ami Voice? Yes. Um, so Pav was asking before. Is that a program that can be used for any language or is it just for, for English within a Japanese context? And also Bridget has asked about it, asking, is it like Elsa Speaks? Yeah, I think I, I, I haven't used Elsa that much, but uh, I think this program, program is only designed only for Japanese EFL learners. So uh, I, uh, and, uh, I think mm, it might be but Elsa offer a lot of uh, language options. So, and then the, the function a little bit different. I think Elsa doesn't offer this kind of, you know, frequency visual feedback, but they, uh, they give, uh, Elsa give, uh, uh, gives uh, this kind of segmental problems that the speaker has. Great. Um, thank you, Bridget, you clarified your question. Um, it wasn't Elsa, it was Ami Voice, which Akiko has put up on the slide now. So hopefully that's answered everyone's questions. Super. Any other questions for Akiko? Okay. Uh, okay. Lina Gordyshevskaya, who will also be speaking later today, um, she's asked, how can one get the installation file for Ami Voice? So that's, that seems to have, um, yeah, grabbed a lot of people's attention, the software you're using. Is it an open access software or how, how, would, uh, how would one get hold of it? Uh, you mean that the, 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 if, if it's available, this yeah. Ami voice is available. In your, actually, it's a it's really old uh, software and then uh, uh, it's not available uh, online, I guess. And uh, so I, I, I use it. I'm sorry. Wait. I don't know if someone was asking a question there. Carry on, Akiko. Okay, so I'm sorry, I think it's not available in everywhere, but uh, uh, not only Elsa, but there are many uh, sound recognition software uh, are available online. I, I Actually, I searched, but uh, uh, so I wondered uh, I should uh, share those software, but uh, I think it's best for me to to, inter to introduce the software I'm using. So, yeah. so that's why I am chose this software. I'm sorry yeah. uh, that, that the, <laughs> it's not available everywhere. No problem. Um, I have a question if I'm if I'm allowed to interject for a moment, everyone. Um, so you you showed us that really interesting slide comparing the effects of memory and motivation on pronunciation. Up <laughs> really interesting. Um, OK. How, how important do you think is it for teachers to be thinking about their students' memory and, and working on exercises that might improve students' phonological memory? How important is that in your opinion? Uh, okay, so so maybe I talked about a little bit in, in, my, prison, in my talk, but uh, I think especially for beginners, uh, they, they depend on the uh, they need to use a lot of memory capacity to produce the produce the English speech. So, and, um, and for example, so even this and repeat type of activity, if the sentence is long, they cannot pay attention to the pronunciation because they need to read read a lot and retrieve the information how to pronounce pronounce the sound. So I think if if you, if you teach a, a elementary level of learners, you need to pay. Uh, you need to cons um, yeah. You need to design the tasks, and then the, you need to reduce the cognitive burden in those tasks. 
And by doing that through these, you know, musical or, or film activities, students are going to naturally remember it more easily. Yeah, right, right, exactly. So for music, they, yeah, they remember the, and even the speaking, uh, even the student's pronunciation is, is really low, is bad in speaking level. When it comes to singing, the pronunciation suddenly changes. So I think music has a, a, a good possibility to improve students' <clears throat> pronunciation. Mm, absolutely. It just bypasses that kind of language area, doesn't it? Goes, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So much more easily. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, any other questions for Akiko? Write them into the chat box if you like. Um, some people are, are discussing alternative uh, technologies and software. People are talking about um, uh, Pratt and AM Pitch. Ah, Pratt, yes. Pratt, yeah. But Pratt is not uh, student friendly. I mean, it's oh. just <laughs> it's for researchers. But I think I use it, and I think it's very helpful for software mm -hmm. to to analyze, the, identify the problems of the learner's speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think there are a lot of you know speech re uh, recognition software, and then I actually one of my colleagues used uh, Siri uh, iPhone, mm -hmm. and then so so they use the uh, Siri to check their pronunciation is that intelligible or not. But uh, I don't completely trust the quality of the sound recognition. But just a reference, I think it's a, it might be a good uh, way. Great. A good good uh, good application. Sandra has asked um, another question about Ami Voice. Um, I'm not sure. Tell us if you if you know. Do you know if this software is matching against a native speaker model or um, an intelligible model? Do you know that? Yeah, actually, I'm not. I'm not that much information about that. But uh, yeah, so I think they have the uh, speech data. To mm -hmm. in order to evaluate the speech, and then I think they basically uh, uh, use uh, American. Um, I heard that uh, they use American accent, accent, um, pronunciation. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, actually, I tried before using this software, and I tried to imitate. <laughs> and my pronunciation is not good, but uh, I tried to imitate the British <laughs> accent, but. Uh, that the feedback was kind of bad, but <laughs> it's it's it might not it may be just because of bad my bad my pronunciation, but uh, I'm not sure that it, it because it's based on the American accent. So no, I think um, that happens to a lot of us. I've I've done the same thing myself. Okay. Uh, I use one of these um, apps, and it's given me uh, not so great feedback. Also, <laughs> right. Oh, <I'm> so, <laughs> so, I, so when I use this software, I I always it tell a student that you don't have to completely trust this <laughs> uh, uh, feedback. But, so I try to, otherwise uh, some of the students were kind of disappointed with the always bad feedback. So, mm -hmm. Great. so when you use this kind of software, you need some help. Uh, you need to help your students mm -hmm. in a different way. Great. Uh, Melanie Hassel, hello Melanie, has asked um, just for a little bit of clarif clarification on the term age of onset. And she's asked, can you tell us, is that the age that you start learning your L2? Right, in the learning. So start learning when they start the language. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another question from Sarah. Uh, Sarah has asked, how can you get students to transfer ability in singing to ability in speaking. Um, as mentioned, students' production can be very different, absolutely. Mm -mm, I'm, I'm sorry, can you? I can repeat that. She's, uh -huh. asked, she's asked about how we can transfer this, the, the practice from the singing practice, like Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, for example, mm -hmm. into speaking practice. How do we transfer? Is there an explicit step from the singing to the speaking to, to bring those ah, okay yeah actually so for the so the, the teaching practice I shared was just a uh, just a one example and I'm not sure how they move the singing to uh, uh, speaking maybe even if can if the student uh, can sing the song like a twinkle twinkle omitting the unnecessary words but when 
when they engage in the regular speaking task, they might have still have a you know Japanese accent, but so but I think that it's just kind of idea to uh, to for um, to for for students to pay attention to the rhythm pattern of English. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, Vilta, hello Vilta, uh, was saying, um, yes, that, that, that there's an obvious correlation between musical ability and pronunciation. And I think we'll all have, have heard lots of research about that. There's, there's lots of studies out there. Um, she talks about uh, opera singers, for example, who have to sing in different languages. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we all know things like jazz chants. And I think Mark Hancock is here. He uses raps and rhymes and things. So it's it's quite a, um, a common thing nowadays, isn't it, to use these these kind of musical processes to, to kind of keep sounds in the in the memory longer and and get students used to them. OK, uh, question now from Gregor. Gregor has asked, have you found it was possible possible to transfer the pronunciation skill, oh, same thing actually. <laughs> okay, skills acquired in singing. Yeah, so singing. many people are interested in the in the in the, in the, in the move move. It's not move. Transferring from singing to uh, to speaking. Yeah, I think I should research about it. Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, Melanie has asked, could you explain a little bit more about the hertz and the passband levels? Oh. Just, just a little bit. Uh, pass band. So, uh, um, let me. Uh, uh, here. So, pass band is, uh, you know, it refers to maybe I, re I might repeat the same thing, but uh, uh, so depending on the language. The, the main uh, frequency uh, range is different. So for, for, for me, um, uh, English like a s, uh, th, f sound, f sound, which is really high frequency. So it's, for me, it's kind of difficult to recognize those sounds because uh, Japanese pass band does not cover those uh, spe uh, the frequency. So that's a kind of passband differences. So, um, and the, the, it's the range of uh, frequency that are predominantly in the language. Does, did, did, I'm sorry, did I answer? I think so. So yes, absolutely. Lovely. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. Apologies if I don't get to your question because there are quite a few comments here. Um, Akiko, if we don't get to everyone's questions, are people, are they able to email you? Have you got answers? Of course, yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Great. Yes. So we'll try and get a couple more questions in, in the last couple of minutes. Um, uh, Akiko, you and I had a really interesting discussion about, just before the session, about the advantages of both ah, L1 yeah. and L2 speakers. Yeah. Clarice okay. has asked you to talk a little bit more about that as ah, well. Okay, yeah. So this morning I was I was rehearsing this presentation and I, so when I measured the time, it was almost 60 minutes. So maybe I should cut somewhere. So that's why. And I, I might want to skip the, uh, the native uh, language. Okay, so so native language uh, in Japan, there is a general belief. I mean, general, no, very strong belief that the native speaking teachers have a uh, advantage when teaching pronunciation. So, which is why uh, many English language schools want all their instructors to be native speaking teachers, so that they can you know attract more students. Now, of course, native speaking teachers are. Uh, generally have an advantage in providing native speech, native speech sounds. And uh, in particular, I think they're, uh, they're often more able to better evaluate the student's pronunciation than non-native speaking, non speaking teachers. However, unless properly trained in phonetics, these native speaking teachers might not have experienced the problems their learners are facing because they have acquired the sounds through it's not unconscious, but unconscious learning when they were really young. Uh, 
So this means that uh, some native speaking teacher may have difficulties in explaining how to produce these sounds. And um, their instruction might tend to be more intuitive, such as listening and listen and repeat or imitating type of instruction. And uh, but this approach could be more effective when teaching young learners as their developmental flexibility makes it easier to learn L2 sounds in the same way they, uh, that they learn their L1. But in, co in construct for adult learners who already have an established native language sound system, it is more difficult to teach them to produce uh, the target language sound by only this and repeat type of instruction. And uh, for adults, it's more helpful to get the verbal procedural explanation to learn L2 pronunciation. So in that sense, non-speakers might be helpful uh, because they share the L1 with their students and then um, and, uh, they can understand or anticipate or detecting the students' problems. So uh, they know the difficulties and uh, how to address the problems because they um, they might have experienced the same problems as language learners. Yes. So uh, yeah. uh, providing students with procedural explanation of how to produce a sound and a tip sound overcoming their problems can be useful for adult learners. And, uh, and because so uh, they have the cognitive abilities to understand and make use of these explanations. So, but I'm not sure if we agree with that or not, but uh, yeah, I think <laughs> ideally team teaching would be uh, beneficial for for students. I think that's <laughs> this is what I wanted to say <laughs> in this on this topic. I think that's a perfect explanation. And as an L1 speaking teacher, that was exactly my experience when I started teaching. I had no idea how to explain things, and I would have to go to my L2 colleagues and say, "How do you do this?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I had a similar exp uh, uh, experience, and uh, one of my colleagues, I, uh, she is American, and uh, she asked me, uh, what's, uh, how to tell me how to pronounce ga, Japanese ga. <laughs> I, can't pronounce, I can't explain it. Ga is ga, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, anyway. Thank you so much, Akiko. Um, unfortunately, okay. that does bring us to the end of our session of okay. Open Plenary. Huge thank you to Akiko. That was absolutely yes. fascinating. And thank you. I'm really appreciate you giving me such a great uh, opportunity. Yeah. It's thank our you. pleasure. It's our pleasure. And hopefully we'll, we'll have you back again in future. Okay. Thank Great. You. Okay, so um, uh, as we've mentioned, so we're going to move on now. Thank you, Akiko. We're going to um, introduce you now to Adam Scott, who is Joint Coordinator of PRONSIG. And Adam is going to be telling us all about our sponsor for today, Sensations English. Adam, over to you. Hello. Can you hear me okay? We can. Brilliant. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see my screen okay? Brilliant. So, um, uh, first of all, thank you very much, Akiko. That was a mind blowing, brilliant. Um, it's so good to hear such um, uh, expertise. Um, and um, yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, I'm a little bit stunned by it all. Um, uh, so, one of the reasons I'm here today is. Um, uh, in my other role as um, the ELT specialist at Sensations English. And um, so I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about Sensations English sponsors of this conference. And um, we're delighted to be able to support um, IATF for Pronsig um, today. And um, we think that there's a really good synergy between the work that we do and the work that Pronunciation SIG does. And that might be slightly because I'm involved in it. Um, uh, so I'd just like you to introduce you to Sensations English a little bit. It's a way to access engaging intersectional content, which is always person-centered, um, always at five levels of English from A2 to C1, um, always complete with ready-made digital tasks that you can use with your learners. And there are also lesson plans, which are frameworks for using it with any, um, any of the resources uh, to support usage and to help you kind of uh, get started with this, because I'm sure you'll have lots of ideas to use with it. As you can see here, there's a wide range of different sections um, and you get 
the, com the company produces three new pieces of news each week, all at five levels, two video reports and one article and audio news report. Um, there are seven themes. Uh, there's real world situations and um, the language is graded carefully to make sure that the different levels scaffold development and allow for differentiation within the same class and the activities and study tools I've just said about they are all based on the content from the report so they're recycling that English which has been expertly written in um, five different levels. Um, as I said there are seven different um, themes community, culture, entertainment, hard news, innovation, lifestyle, and natural world. And they're always available in this menu bar at the top of each page. How do we do this? Who are we? Well, we you can trust our quality and the authenticity of our resources because we use AFP news content. So we're recycling news footage, which has already been created, which is good for the environment as well. Um, uh, ELT professionals with at least 10 years of classroom experience as well as many years of materials writing experience are required to write all of the graded content. Uh, we use K-lists collocation and idiomatic usage to scaffold the levels. Um, we use a, a, an analytic tool called Lexile to then check what we've done. And um, obviously this tool wouldn't be enough on its own, but it's a great nudge to us as writers to make sure what we're doing is accurate and it's based on a, an algorithm that um, works on comprehensibility of content. Then everything is produced by BBC trained media production teams who also select the stories that we're going to use and the person who's in charge of that ran his own news company for primary and secondary for many years after running BBC News Round and Blue Peter. So he's got a really clear idea of what's a suitable story for an educational context. Um, and everything is guided by the Common European Framework, of course. So um, that's just a little summary of what I've just said here. The most important thing I think for us is the global English interview clips, which um, are integrated into news reports. I just wanna quickly show you a little bit of um, a couple of reports now. And that means that I need to reshare and share my sound. So there we go. Let's see if this works. Can you hear my sound? Is one of the smallest countries in the world, but it produces a, Sorry, a lot me. of carbon dioxide. This hurts the environment. The government wants to start using renewable energy. The best option for Singapore is solar power, but this is difficult in such a small country. Semcorp is an energy company in Southeast Asia. It is solving Singapore's space problem. Semcorp is placing solar farms on water. Jen Tan is senior vice president of Semcorp. So after exhausting the rooftops, the available land, which is very scarce, the next uh, big potential is actually our water area. And we have got many reservoirs in Singapore that we can do floating, um, dual use floating and reservoir at the same time. Where the elephant roams the southern Kenyan wilderness. He has survived droughts and illegal ivory hunters for almost 50 years. However, he now faces an even more dangerous threat, the avocado. The popularity of avocados in wealthy countries has increased year after year. Last year, agricultural business Kili Avo Fresh was given permission to plant avocados on Kenyan land, which it bought from the local Maasai people. The planned farm is close to a national park where many elephants live. Environmental groups say the farm will have a huge impact on the elephants. Daniel Ole Sambu from the Big Life Foundation is concerned about where the elephants will reproduce. There are two farms there and both of them are exactly in the middle of a wildlife uh, dispersal area. So just to give you those two examples, um, uh, they were at different levels. I hope you noticed the difference in the levels of the 
of the um, scripted audio that then surrounds these um, uh, global in English users and speakers. And the great thing is that that really scaffolds what is said and, and what is then comprehended as a result of that. And as we know, there's so many variables that we can't still put our finger on about that. So this is creating that really supportive environment. Um, there are um, plenty more examples of um, global English speakers, and we just kind of clipped a few of them for you to see here, covering the whole of the globe, including in this first tip, Antarctica, where, you know, no one's um, Ladies and indigenous. Gentlemen, have a wonderful first day here in Antarctica. Uh, be sure to uh, dress up warmly and enjoy. He was not arrested, but we asked him to leave the booth and to leave the fair, and we have his contact and everything, so we can go. We can go further, but I don't think I don't think we will. So uh, maybe if my music attracts younger people, it, it'll be a good opportunity uh, for them to know about uh, like the uh, the Buddhism. Tropical winemaking is really up and coming. A lot of people, uh, a lot of winemakers from around the world, they want to know what we do here because um, the climate is changing, and so uh, they have to adapt to warmer temperatures, higher rainfalls in their regions too. You know, if you step on even the grass here, security asks you to leave. But I think now they get to know us because we keep coming here. So they start feeling that we're playing safe, we're not doing anything wrong. So I think it's getting famous more and more. For example, I can't show clearly a bottle of my wine. I can't post on social media what the wine tastes like, how or why it's good. And also there's a restriction in the form of excise tax. When, uh, when I come to here and I feel like uh, uh, I am king, huh? and you know, the, the parao, Oh, king of the Egypt. We are also increasing the awareness of our guests on the problematic of climate change, for example, and on, on all the many changes that are taking place. Whatever rainfall that uh, we receive throughout the year, but then it just flows off. We cannot tap them. We cannot even harness those waters. We don't have that uh, proper system of uh, harnessing the rain. So um, from that, you'll see that um, what we're really doing is trying to bring both worlds together here so that we can best support our students. And um, sometimes our news reports are feature dubbed. Um, uh, speakers and then we always try our hardest to find a speaker from that area to dub that voice so you know being an international network of people that's not too hard for us um, and um, uh, we did have one situation recently where it was a, 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 a French person speaking in Spanish translated into English and that was a very difficult thing to find so in the end we chose a neutral voice to, to voice that because it was it was um, we didn't want to offend or um, put put a different voice into that person's um, artificial voice into that person's speech. So we went for the traditional news um, approach of of having a single voice to dub that. Um, but there are also teacher tools in Sensations English. Um, uh, there's a teacher zone where which is a portal into digital task setting, class setting, organisation and student um, logins and all the data from all the activities students do are stored there. Um, and so that leads to um, formative feedback 
that you can um, analyze and add to your own monitoring. And then there's user guides and lesson plans, as I mentioned before. These are the kind of things that you can do in the teacher gradebook, create classes, allocate students, set tasks, monitor, and then review progress. And um, you get this console where you can see what is um, being done by the students and you can see the detailed feedback on any activity they've done and you can even type in and then send them feedback which goes into their notifications. This is what the site looks like. Um, so at the top of the screen there are the different tabs for the different sections, um, different themes and then uh, you can also see the news this week, the most viewed ones and then the most viewed in all of the different um, categories that we've got. And um, we are an Elton's finalist this year, nominated for innovation in learning, learner resources. So we're really delighted about that. And so this is the most recent story, which is always the front one on the screen. And you can see there we're set at the upper intermediate level. There's a transcript there that I can look at and um, I can change the level if I want to. And then I can also um, do these activities. I'm just gonna show you the comprehension activity because we script a comprehension activity for each of the five levels with different questions for each level which is hard when you're using the same text five times um, uh, and um, at, at the higher levels we're really trying to make this um, match up to the expectations of exams like IELTS and um, Cambridge so that we're checking that we're testing for inference and um, exploring language that way and of course, John Field would be pleased that we try and keep our questions as short as possible so that we're not testing reading. Um, you can get access to the transcript there and you can always go back to watch the video again. I deliberately got a question wrong there just to show you that it's not all plain sailing. And then you get those scores and then you can go back. Also, there are some learning tools, including um, shadowing the newsreader which is you get to listen to the newsreader's speech and then record your own voice and then you can listen back and compare those two. So rather than talking about the uh, like um, Elsa and stuff like that, which we were talking about earlier, um, this is where the students are actually in charge of noticing the differences um, uh, between the, the two different types of accent that are being used. So, so that's that. Um, and that's it really. Um, if you sign up to the site, if you go there, you can get a seven day and, and click teacher, you can get a seven day teacher demo free, which is emailed to your inbox. So you can try things out for yourself. You, you, you won't be able to use it with your students then because the account is limited, you know, it's, it's a demonstration one, but you'll be able to check it out for yourself. And if you wanted to play it on a screen with your students, I'm sure you could. Thank you ever so much. I'm really looking forward to the rest of today. And um, uh, I think it's about time we went to the next sessions. Adam, just before we move on, there was a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, someone asked, do you happen to know if this is accessible in China for teachers that are teaching in China? So we ran some teacher trials and got some interesting data from that. You'll have to check on your um, internet connection. Some um, Someone coincidentally who I was uh, doing my master's with was uh, signed up for one of these trials and she said that it was it was too slow because of the, the, the way that they limit external websites. Um, but I know that the company is talking to um, a person in a, a company in China about developing that relationship. So if they want that, then please tell us and that will nudge things further forwards as well. But um, yes, yeah, see what you could do is if you were watching stuff and if you had a good connection, you could screen capture it so you know it's going to play later. Great. And Nicholas White asked, are there institutional subscriptions for Sensations? Yes, there are. So um, uh, you can um, go to Sensations English and um, there's a selection, a section that says teachers and schools, and you can um, register your interest there, or you can just email me adam at sensationsenglish.com. Fantastic. Super. Thank you, Adam. That's excellent. And um, yeah, definitely matches with our Pronsig ethos. 
having access to all these global English speakers to take into the classroom, it's, it's absolutely um, it's so important and um, it just makes life so much easier because you don't have to go looking for these things. So definitely grab a, uh, have a have And a look making for all the activities yourself, that's the nice thing. Your planning time can focus on your students and their needs rather than all of it being taken up by writing the questions or making the activities. Perfect.